Last video I showed you how to build PowerShell module, use module manifest, but what if you want to organize files in certain manner in the way that actually is widely popular across PowerShell community? And then Petyanch with one press of one button or one script that we can actually take all our scripts and functions and actually create nice module. Let's have a look. Hi everyone, Kami here with yet another PowerShell video. And today we'll be focusing on actually building and organizing our PowerShell module so that all the files, you know, scripts, will be actually sitting nicely in the public private folders. And then with invoking one command, we will literally build a new version of, of the module. And for this one, because we could really do this, if you think about this, PowerShell module is just the text files and PowerShell functions. If you think about that, PowerShell functions are just text files and PowerShell module is also a really text file unless you write it in C sharp. So in other words, I was saying building, but really we're glorifying the moving, copying, pasting files, text files. It's, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just really what is it with PowerShell. Uh, but anyways, I think having a framework that we can take and organize our files, and this is actually framework that is adapted by PowerShell community, will then allow us to very easily, one, allow others to work on our modules whenever we do them, two, plug it in into uh, pipelines, so you can actually automatically use, uh, pipe, you know, continuous integration and, and delivery with that, pipe, with, that, with that module. So let's have a look how this all works and have fun, I guess. So for today's video, we will be using PowerShell module called Module Builder. It will do all the heavy lifting for us once we organize our files in a specific way. If you're interested more, you can you can look on the website. I dropped the link on, on the description, but pretty much it's all here. And whatever I'll be doing today, I'll be very strongly following the, the, the guidance from this module. And I've been using this module personally for quite a few months, maybe even years now. So I know it's actually works and it's reliable. It's reliable when you run this local on your machine. And it's reliable when you're using in the cloud like Azure pipelines on GitHub Actions. So it absolutely makes building of module a bliss. It's really great piece of code. Okay. And here's pretty much what I did prepare for today. I did prepare a little very sample module and I took and I took a lot of examples from the previous one, so a lot of functions from the from the last one, because there's not really point of for me writing very complicated code just to show you how to build the module. Yeah, we're focusing on actually how to build modules so that you can very easily go and convert your modules for this one. And also the code for this will be on the GitHub, so you can go download this to your machine and then actually try to follow the steps as I do. That'll be probably easier. And you can then actually what I very often do actually, even even now when I have a when I'm creating a new module from scratch, I literally very often just take another module, copy paste it, obviously make certain changes so that we reflect my new things, but I have already things like follow the structure, organize and all the files I need. Okay? But anyways, pretty much what you see here, yeah, the this the root of the folder where we write is actually will be the name of my repo. So in that case, module is called KP info. So I call that module KP info. And what do we have in here? Obviously I have Git ignore because I don't want certain stuff to go to the cloud. And in that case, this is pretty much when we build it, it will get outputted to the output folder. We have install requirements function and that functions function script. And that script will pretty much in here always put things actually need to build I need to install before running the build. And it's literally, so I have just array of the modules I want, and then I just specify that we need to, yeah, this is a bit funny about how to do that. Uh, at least that's the way I found most reliable is go get installed module and pretty much when you kind of find that module, it froze. So then when it actually froze and I can actually tell it, okay, we can install it because I've already have this module installed, I guess. I think I did. Yep, because obviously I was done preparing this before. I already have, already have it, so PowerShell lists it, but pretty much go around this and you can have it. And this is also what, in that case, I would use on the CA 
on the CI, we'll just tell it. Yeah, one of the steps, go install this stuff. We have some basic readme, which pretty much describes how is the how is the structure, and we also have link to the module builder. So even you can get a link from here. So I don't think we need to go through that readme. And then we have our module builder script, and when we come back to it, actually once I show you the folder structure. Because first of all, the folder structure is quite important. And for this case, pretty much module builder when you run it, and let's just have a look on the module module builder. We have pretty much three functions only. It does a lot behind the scenes, but pretty much we'll be using this one that for building module. You could go from the help, but because I have examples, I don't think we really need to. But module builder expects certain way of organizing files from you. So for example, all our code we start in the source directory. So we see I have root of my module and I have root of my repo and actually source code kind of exists in the source directory, yeah? And what I have there, I have my module manifest, yeah? Notice that I don't have a PSM1 file yet. I just reference it and pretty much module builder will then create the, 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 module, the module file with that matches the name of this manifest. So it's not there yet, so that might be a bit confusing, but no worries, once you run it, you will. And pretty much it's just really basic manifest. However, there are certain things required for it to work. For example, we need to have functions to export must be uncommented and etc. And it's all listed on that website of the I told you, so you can always reference. But pretty much we have very basic and you will see what will happen once we run it. And then we have a couple of folders, public and private. And public functions probably as you get, guess by now, is that functions that are exposed to the user. And private functions are not exposed to the user. So it's all our helpers. So for example, in here, because all these functions actually are wrapping some sort of API, in that case, I, I tend to, in that case, have my private function that actually will do all the invoking for me, all the API calls for me. And the reason for that one is, for example, there's often the case we need to authenticate and then we need to store, say, a token or something like that for authentication. The job of this function is actually do it for me. So then all functions, I have one function that will, let's say, expose, connect to our resource. And then once it's connected, this function will then take care of all, all or passing all the headers and all the requirements for API. It's quite interesting. And once you get it, it's fairly straightforward to work with. But pretty much what I've done here. So we have three functions, which are public, accessible to the user. I have one function that actually does heavy lifting for me. And for example, while I'm developing things, yeah, I can pretty much just go around them, load them to the memory, and I can, you know, just execute them. Oh, wait, it wasn't. So for, so for example, yeah, I can run it, or if I would like to debug it, I can actually still debug my code at this point, yeah? So I'm not really using any any functionality. Like if I had actually working on the loose files, I can still absolutely go debug things. So this is nice. Well, okay. So this is the folder structure, yeah? I just remind you once again, because this is kind of, you kind of need that for the module view to work. Source folder, in the source folder, I have private public folders. You can have all this, like class or enum or anything, like let's say you will be bundling all the modules with it, nesting your modules. You can absolutely nest them, but then when we run module builder, we need to tell it you need to copy that files as well. Okay, so yeah, absolutely we can do it, but for now I'm just focusing on kind of bare metal, bare minimum. We need this thing to go. All right, so I hope this is fairly clear enough by now. What we want now is to actually look how we invoke module builder. And this is pretty much, I guess I'm going a bit step forward from at this point, but we have this in the script so that, you know, when somebody will copy this files down from the repo somewhere, they can literally just go and build it. And second point, because we have it in this specific way, we can also have it then very nicely plugged in into CI/CD. So actually this is with the mind that we're going to automate that at some point, yeah? But still, nevertheless, we can run it like now. 
So what do we do here? I just have one parameter for the version. So when I run this script, I can actually pass in a version of it, yeah? And then also I require module builder. And require is a really nice feature to in, in, in the scripts you can have, because it will pretty much test if you have this module installed. If not, it will then throw for you. So you don't need to actually write your own logic for testing whether, you know, it is whether it is installed or not, you just say, I require this module. And, and yeah, and this is not a mistake. This is how to do it. Uh, hashtag requires, yeah? Module and then module name. You can also specify specific version, etc. But at this point, I'm, even if you just pulled it and you never had module middle installed, when you try to run it, it will straight away tell you, you need this module installed. So you know you require it. Cool. And there's some parameters we have. And just for now, just to show you a, a very minimum version, we just specify as well as well. I will enable others just to show you how it changes as we build, but for now we just stick to the basic version. Okay, so pretty much what I do, I will in that case sitting in the root of my repo and I only pass in one parameter called source path. Yeah, source path is wherever this file is, then source and my module manifest. So let's run it. Okay. And as we can see, it already created output. We can even specify our own file, but we don't need to. So let's see, we have output and, and then pretty much we can see that it built the structure output, module name and the version and version 001 because on the source on my manifest, this is what I have. So this is expected. Yeah. And let's see what's changed now. So we still have PSM1 file. The module builder does a few things here. For one, it takes all the files from the you know private public and then puts them here and also gives you this nice reference. So when you are especially debugging something, you actually source code this, you can straight away tell which file it is and at which one it starts. Yeah. And because oh, I didn't mention this one. I mean I mentioned on the previous previous video and here. The idea is you keep one function per file. Yep. Yeah? And file name equals function name. So that's how you organize your files. Oh yeah. I did, didn't mention it on this, I did mention previously. So you see then when it builds, it will very nicely. You don't really need to do that, but it makes finding your code when you are need to change something on debug super easy. So anyways, we have this one and obviously that's my function. And then we have my other functions. Yeah. So you can probably get, yeah, I told you about copy pasting. Well, there we go. Building PowerShell module at its best, copy and pasting text. And then on the manifest, we see we have our module, etc. And here, functions to export, yeah? So we see you have this three, only public ones, but no private one. Now, why this way is very nice to work with? Because if I want, for example, to make this function private or otherwise, I just move it across. And once I moved it and I build it again, it's gone, yep. So this is the way how you can very easily move your files, make them private, public. We see there are certain ways. I mean, well, people say that I know. I, for example, see when private functions don't have hyphen in them or some other way. But this is the way how you can extremely easy build things and make them public, private. So quite often, let's say when I'm working on something and it's not finished, but I need to check in the code. I want to check in the code. I can actually just keep checking into the private so it never gets exposed. No, and no function will use it, so there's no harm in it. And when my actually function is ready, then I just move it to public, done. I have public function exposed. I don't see this is the best way, but certainly you can do that. Uh, so what we have the next? So for the next one, we can actually put in a custom files folder. So if I want to include something else with my module, I can absolutely bring, you know, other files. Or if I will have here other modules or something like that, I can just point it, you take this files with you and build it. So for example, I really like to include readme with my module. So in the case, somebody will just go and grab it. Then they will actually have how to use it. Yeah, like not everyone is maybe interested in running a uh, help or maybe they want to pass in some information. Well, you have my module, you have readme. So at least you have that much. You know what is it? Yep. What else we can add? Obviously there's much more stuff we can add. We can actually specify our own version. Uh, so when I specify a version, let's see what's going to happen now. See, now I have version 001. And now, because obviously my version is defaults to version one, 
I that's why I have version one now. But even if I come here, version one. So in that way, if now I was in the CI and I will build in this, you know, on through the this module through the CI, I will probably have some kind of automatic incrementing, let's say, of the patch version. Yeah, I don't bring new features. I patch something. So I just run my CI. It will automate automatic increment the version for me. And therefore, I will have a higher version number. So that works pretty cool when you have it. And one more feature, because I don't know, I personally, because I don't like to have these versions here, because it's all bits on the CI when I usually run it. So I don't really need to know the version of the folder. So I can actually just specify that I don't want version output. So when I run this now, it pretty much goes, clears everything here, and I just have an unversion module. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's versioned, it's just the all the way exists, it's not very interesting. It's your own personal preference. I just find it it's easier to work that way, but all your choice. And also, if you're interested what's going on with building, we can also specify that it's variables. And actually, you can see how copy pasting te uh, text happens on the fly. Yeah, so nothing that, that, you know, that much probably exciting. But if you're actually interested, I don't know why it's, what's going on here, absolutely you can get verbose output. So I guess we have our module, it's built now. We can import it, yeah? Let's see if it actually works. So let's try, tell you what, let's open. So let's load it. IPMO and then that'll be output. Nope. Ah, because obviously there's a name. Oh, boy. JP info, okay. I'll put now again function name and now loading my PSD1 file. So let's see if it's loaded. It's loaded. It's version one. That's my three functions. And obviously I've added a, a prefix to the to the module. So it is, let's just double check if it's the same prefix I'm expecting it to be. KPI, yep, so all my verbs are prefixed by KPI. That makes sense. So let's now just to try to run it. Yep, I certainly have information. Uh, maybe what? It works. So I think that's pretty much it. That's how you build module. Uh, something that I don't know if it always happens, but in the case, sometimes I've noticed if I load the module to memory and I try to run it, run it now. So let's try to build actually it again. Sometimes it will lock that file. So I tend to, when it happens, the easiest way I found to fix it is just copy that file somewhere else, load from there, it doesn't lock it. It doesn't always do that. I don't know, maybe it's antivirus doing this, maybe not. But just in the case you had hit this problem that you can't build it, you can't override your module that you built, just move it somewhere else and load from there. And that should be it. Cool. Hope you've enjoyed this one. Great. So when I'm talking about building modules, now you know what I'm talking about. And this is the way I've been using for quite a long time and it just works. So really the next logical step will be to build it automatically. In other words, I push my code to GitHub or Azure DevOps and in that and then Petty gets the pipeline fires and actually builds it and spits out a module for me. So I have it there. I don't even need to press that button anymore. I just go commit, push, done. That's all I care about. Obviously then on the pipeline we decide what happens, whether you know is does it actually going to fire a pipeline when I just committed or when I only you know do let's say a pull request to the main re repo. I mean, main branch, but that's obviously up to agree. So next video will be pretty much to carry on with take the way how to build this module and we're going to build it automatically in the cloud. Stay tuned and I see you there. Bye bye.